Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's third Thursday webinar from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. This is part of our continuing series of webinars where we explore different topics that are important to all of us in the Parkinson's community. Um, as always, you'll be able to participate in our webinar by um, using that box that you see in the middle of the screen. You can type in your questions there in that Q&A box and we'll do our best to uh, respond to as many of those questions as we can over the course of our hour. Our topic today is uh, genetic discoveries and how they lead uh, to uh, Parkinson's uh, therapy. So we know that there will be important questions that you'll want to pose. And again, we'll do our best to, uh, to get to those. Um, we're also providing the slides uh, from today's webinar for you to download. There's a, a box called uh, resource list that you'll see on the screen. And you can click on that and, and download um, the slides and, and share those uh, with others uh, over the, the course of time in the future. All right, let's review what we're going to be uh, focusing on today. <coughs> Forgive me, I'm also getting over a, a, a flu a cold. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, genetic discoveries and their role in leading to Parkinson's um, therapies. There's been a tremendous breakthrough in the past decade in what we've learned about the genetics and Parkinson's uh, disease, uh, an explosion of, of new research. And we're going to talk some about why that's so important, both to our understanding of the disease and the way in which genes uh, influence uh, proteins that we think are also involved um, in Parkinson's disease. We'll talk about that relationship, how we get from genes to proteins uh, to uh, therapies, and the significance of those potential therapies in Parkinson's disease. We'll also spend some time talking about how you can participate in genetic uh, research, whether or not you carry uh, a Parkinson's disease a mutation or a mutation that's been linked, at least, uh, to Parkinson's disease. The only way we'll make progress is with that kind of research participation. Here's who's joining us as part of our uh, panel uh, webinar uh, today. Uh, first, my, my uh, friend and colleague, Anna Cohn Donnelly. Uh, Anna has been a member of the Michael J. Fox Foundation's uh, Patient Council uh, for a number of years now. She was first diagnosed with Parkinson's disease eight years ago, and Anna carries uh, the LERC2 a mutation, which is one of the genetically linked causes of, of Parkinson's uh, disease that we'll be talking about today. Anna, thanks so much for being part of our, our webinar today. Welcome. Glad to be here. Joining, happy to have you join us. Joining us as well is uh, Dr. Roy Alkalay. Dr. Alkalay is an assistant professor of neurology at Columbia University and one of the leading researchers exploring this relationship between genetics and Parkinson's disease. Roy Alkali, thanks for being with us as well. Thank you for having me. And joining us too is Dr. Andy Singleton. Uh, Dr. Singleton is the chief of the Laboratory of Neurogenetics at the National Institute on Aging within the National Institutes of Health. Andy has been uh, working in the vineyards of genetic research and Parkinson's disease for a good while uh, now and has helped further uh, many of the advances that we're going to be talking about. Andy, thanks again for being part of our program. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. All right. All right, let's uh, get started. And we're going to talk a little bit first about um, genetics and Parkinson's and a little, just a little bit of kind of genetics 101. And, and um, Dr. Akale, first, um, you know, we see that first point at, at the top that we have uh, <clears throat> our genetic differences are, are instrumental um, in, in who, who we are and, and different uh, distinctions um, within us. Um, and we use the example there from eye color to risk for disease. Sometimes that's not quite well understood. We sometimes think that there might be a, a red hair gene versus a brown hair gene. And that's not really the way it goes. So can you give us just a little bit of deeper understanding, I guess, about the role genetics um, play in our differences, protect, perhaps particularly in the way in which it might lead to propensity for a particular disease condition? Uh, sure, thank you. So um, I think that there are. Um, uh, typical common, uh, typical conditions that uh, everybody knows are uh, what we consider very genetic, where the genetic risk factor is known, and if you have it, 
one would have the disease like um, Tay-Sachs or cystic fibrosis or thalassemia. Uh, but the fact is that most of the medical conditions that um, uh, people uh, have and that, that makes people go to the doctor are a bit more, more complex, and we call them uh, genetically complex conditions or disorders where there isn't a single gene that if you have a mutation in it, you'll have the disease, and if you don't have a mutation in it, you won't have the disease, but rather that um, multiple risk factors uh, may lead to the development of the condition, and um, um, uh, this is um, – and, and the, there's – genetic risk factors, there are environmental risk factors, and there's interaction among all these risk factors that we don't quite uh, know um, in many cases how exactly they interact, but that's where a lot of the research focuses on. And just to give it a specific example, uh, LARC2 is considered the most common um, genetic dominant risk factor for Parkinson's. So if you have the gene, you have mutation in the gene, you have a significantly increased risk for Parkinson's, but still many studies show that only one-third of those with a mutation will develop Parkinson's, which means that there's a um, contribution from a lot of other genes and environmental factors that would modify this risk and may change whether you'll have the disease or not or if you have it when you're younger or older. And so really all of this exists on a kind of continuum that, that increases one's odds perhaps one way or the other. And Andy Singleton, you've been such a pioneer in this field. I want to come to you next. We see these next two points that, that um, relay how much now we think genetics plays a role in Parkinson's. If I had, if we had been doing this, uh, some version, there weren't webinars 20 years ago, but if we had been doing some kind of panel discussion about this topic, the general view would have been that genetics doesn't play any role in Parkinson's at all. Um, Ten years ago, as it says on the slide here, we realized that there were maybe ten genetic regions that it might affect Parkinson's. Now we see that's grown by eightfold, all the way up to 80. Why is that so significant, Andy, in our understanding of Parkinson's, to get a deeper understanding of the role that genetics play in particular? Yeah, I think that um, it, it really bounces off something that, that Roy was talking about um, earlier. Uh, and this is the notion of moving from an idea where it's one gene, one disease, to, to an idea where multiple genetic variants each contribute small amounts to whether you have a particular trait. And that, that trait could be disease. So we've moved from a space where we're trying to find um, single mutations that invariably cause disease to a space where we're trying to find genetic changes that are very, very common in the general population that, that you or I carry that increase or decrease your, your odds for, for disease. So the notion really with, with all of this work is that by um, furthering our genetic understanding, by understanding how variants influence risk and how they control genes and what those genes do, we can use that to understand the, the underlying processes that, that really are the disease, the disease itself. What are the molecular changes, the cellular changes, um, that represent the disease process. And if we, can, if we can use genetics to understand that process, can we then find viable points to, uh, to intervene? So, so Andy, does that mean, in a sense, that rather than looking at genetics as this, well, it just, it just affects this sort of small percentage. We sometimes hear the, the, the phrase that genetics accounts for maybe 10% of, of cases of Parkinson's disease, where there's this direct causal link. What you're arguing is that this deeper understanding of all of the interplay between different genes really means that a deeper understanding of genetics furthers our understanding of the disease for everyone. Or put differently, genetics plays a role in Parkinson's disease for everyone. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's true. And I think you can think of this in two ways. And the two ways are complementary. We look at rare gene mutations and we study those in, in our labs because they're kind of easier to handle, they're easier to conceptualize, and they're easier to model. But we still think that everything we find based on those mutations is generalizable to the typical disease. The, the kind of second part to this is that now we're beginning to understand that every single case of Parkinson's disease has a genetic component. 
and every single case of Parkinson's disease probably has an environmental component. We're not really in this space anymore of is it uh, genetics or is it environment? It's, it's clearly both in everybody. Well, let's drill a bit deeper then and explore what we're beginning to learn in this complicated interrelated interplay between genes and the environment and, and others. And we've, we've listed on this slide here uh, some of the genes that, that are of the most, uh, gene mutations that are of the most interested, most interesting uh, to scientists like you and, and Roy Alcala. Um, among them, uh, the synuclein uh, gene, SNCA, GDA, and MARC2, which we've already referenced. And Anna, come down and let me bring you in for a, a quick perspective at this point, because as someone who is living with Parkinson's disease and also knows that you carry the MARC2 mutation, I'm interested because there are a number of people who are already writing in saying, if you have the MARC2, what do you do? Um, I'm interested if you can help us from your point of view as someone living with Parkinson's disease. What did you do when you learned that information? What do you think it's important for patients with Parkinson's disease to do um, if they do discover that they carry one of these particular mutations? I believe so strongly in research and par patient participation in research and have been involved in research studies up until the time I was shown to have a LARC2 mutate gene mutation, but having found that out, it kind of doubled my commitment to get involved. Um, we were just talking about how our understanding of Parkinson's is deepened greatly by studying people who have a particular genetic disorder, and if I can help other people and help myself at the same time, I'm committed to doing that. So finding out was a surprise. I didn't expect to find out I had the gene mutation. I do, and I'm going to try and use that to everybody else's advantage. And we'll talk more about how people can get specifically involved in genetic research as we move forward. Let's take our, our next step um, and talk more about how uh, gene mutations and genetics play a role in the development of disease. And we've walked people through in this particular slide um, the way in which cells um, are the kind of recipes that um, or use the recipes rather that are in our genes to make proteins. And the proteins then do many things. And we list a variety of examples in that. And then we mention that sometimes there are mutations and they cause a dysfunction um, in proteins which play a role in disease. So Roy Alcala, um, can you give us an example of, of what we're learning about that, that there's certain perhaps roles that genetics play in causing proteins to not behave the way we want them to behave, um, in essence, and, and are involved in the disease process. In alpha synuclein, for example, how might that happen? We know that's that sticky protein that gets clumped together in Parkinson's. What's the connection between the genetics of that, the proteins that go bad, and disease? Uh, and you're asking specifically about alpha synuclein. Well, as by way of an example, you can take that though in, in whichever way you, you wish. Sure. So um, I think that the um, when we look at how much we learned about uh, Parkinson's over decades of research, the two um, very important sources of information we have are uh, the genetics, where really there is a much uh, there's a huge influx of data in the last uh, one or two decades. And the other major source of information that helped us advance Parkinson's research is when people uh, who passed away with Parkinson's donated their brains, and um, uh, we look at the brain under the microscope. And um, the overwhelmingly most common change that you see in people with Parkinson's brains uh, under the microscope is the position of the protein alpha-synuclein in um, uh, within the nerve cells, the neurons, in what we call Lewy bodies. Now, um, for, so this association has been known for many decades, and uh, we knew that Lewy bodies are the major finding in Parkinson's uh, brains, and uh, it took a little bit longer to discover that the protein that is deposited in those Lewy bodies is alpha-synuclein. And then uh, uh, to support the 
notion that alpha-synuclein is important in Parkinson's, uh, people discovered that mutations in alpha-synuclein uh, increase the risk for Parkinson's. Now, even uh, more interesting to help us with research, we found that if you have too much of the genetic information of alpha-synuclein, if you have duplication or triplication of the gene, your risk for Parkinson's is increased, and it's probably higher and with a faster progression if you have three copies of the, the gene compared to two copies of the gene. So it's only uh, logical, even though we're still trying to prove it, that maybe reducing the burden of alpha-synuclein or changing the metabolism of alpha-synuclein would either slow down or even prevent Parkinson's. And um, so every time a gene or a mutation is diagnosed that is associated with Parkinson's disease risk, the next question is how can we work on that biological pathway to try to, uh, re, um, to, try to help people with Parkinson's. So with alpha-synuclein, what we hypothesize, and it still hasn't been shown in humans, uh, in, uh, in actual clinical trials, is that maybe reducing the alpha-synuclein burden will reduce Parkinson's uh, rate of progression or maybe even in the future Parkinson's risk. The uh, most relevant, more recently, uh, a couple of uh, clinical trials are starting uh, to uh, initiate, to activate the immune system, one's own immune system, against alpha-synuclein exactly for that purpose of making the immune system get rid of the extra alpha-synuclein, hoping that what, that would help um, slow down Parkinson's. And we'll talk more about where we are with some of those new exciting clinical trials in just a moment. but. Andy Singleton, you were involved in much of that um, early research, and so I, I think this is also a, a, a time where to make a, a key point, perhaps, which is that even though it's we first, you know, there was the genetic mutation of the alpha synuclein gene that caused too much alpha synuclein, therefore caused Parkinson's disease. We then subsequently learned, as Dr. Alkali was mentioning, that alpha synuclein is is involved in everyone who has Parkinson's disease. So this makes this point that, that as we understand more and figure out maybe a, a genetic fix to alpha-synuclein, that's also a fix that might be more broadly applicable, right? This is the, the potential for these therapies is not just for those who carry the mutation. It's for really, we hope at least, much more broadly applicable to people generally living with Parkinson's disease. Yeah, I think that's very true. You know, um, the finding of the synuclein mutations that was back in 1997, and I think that this really um, elegantly showed that you could look at you could look at these very very rare families and gain genetic insights from them that were broadly applicable to to the typical disease. So so we know now that um, carrying very kind of rare changes in synuclein can cause disease but that um, carrying very, very common changes that, that uh, 40 or 50 percent of the population carry um, impart risk for, for, for Parkinson's disease. So they're, they're really, um, synuclein by itself is a really nice uh, example of this continuum of genetic risk and, and how indeed even looking at these rare, uh, these rare families and these rare mutations uh, tells us so much about, about typical, um, typical Parkinson's disease. All right, let's explore um, next um, the kind of mapping procedure that allows us to get from gene to protein to therapy, some of those exciting trials Ankali was mentioning a moment ago. But before we do that, let me bring in, um, bring up an audience um, question because we're getting already a lot of questions about how people find out whether or not they carry a mutation. There are always lots of questions about this, about, about getting genetically uh, tested, whether one should or should not, um, and a lot of interest in that. So before we dig into the material on this particular slide, Dr. Alkali, as someone who's both a, a scientist um, and, and also a, a physician, um, what, what's your general response to people who are writing in now and saying, well, how do I find out if I have a mutation? Should I find out? if I have a mutation? Uh, I think it's a tricky question. Um, I think that the best, um, uh, the best answer would be to think um, what, what are the implications of uh, me finding out that I have a mutation. So I would first 
divide the people who are asking to two major groups, and that's the people who have Parkinson's and the people who do not have Parkinson's. So uh, for the people who have Parkinson's uh, disease, the implications, whether they have a mutation or not, are not as significant because they have Parkinson's. So the finding out if, a gene, if they have a gene that we know, a, a mutation or a change in the gene that is linked to the risk, may help them understand why they develop Parkinson's and also may help them find out whether they're eligible for specific clinical trials. So if one is interested in clinical trials, that would be a very um, actionable uh, thing to do to say, okay, let's see if I have a gene that is linked to a clinical trial that I can participate in. Uh, if one doesn't have uh, such interests, then it's more of a question of uh, uh, intellectual curiosity and I suggest thinking about the implications before getting tested, where the implications are on one hand that you, one would get more information about why Parkinson's developed and how to engage in studies that are linked directly, um, and that's the uh, pros, and on the cons is like, what will you tell your family, your kids, your siblings, people that um, may choose or not choose to get tested uh, if they have that information. With regards to people who do not have Parkinson's disease, um, I think that um, it's, a, it's a tricky question and it's a very personal. Some, uh, I thought that people who don't have the disease would probably not want to get tested and I uh, found out that I'm wrong based on how many family members of my patients got tested through 23andMe or through um, the Michael J. Fox PPMI effort. Um, so I think it's again a personal question. It's a question whether people want to know or not want to know. Either way, I suggest doing it in a system where you can get counseling and information, ideally through a, neuro a Parkinson's center that can offer genetic counseling because many of these genes, if you carry them, if you carry a mutation in them, if you carry a certain variant, it doesn't mean that one would develop Parkinson's, it just means that the Parkinson's risk is increased and you want to sit with someone that can guide you through it a little bit um, like carefully. I think that's really an important point. Anna Condonley, um, let's get your perspective on that. What motivated you to, to get, uh, uh, take a genetic um, test and what are some of the implications that you think people considering that ought to, ought to uh, consider? When I was diagnosed eight years ago, I was shocked because I know nobody in my family, my extended family, who has had Parkinson's and I almost couldn't even spell the word. And I think in some ways for a number of years, I kind of thought maybe I didn't really have it. I have the symptoms and the medications help, but maybe I didn't really have Parkinson's. And I, just by way of background, when Michael J. Fox Foundation came out with Fox Insight, I signed up for it right away. And every three months I've been offering information on medications, symptoms, and how my disease is progressing or not progressing. It's been interesting to be involved in that. And one day about a year ago, I found out that Fox Insight was now connected to 23andMe, and I'd have an opportunity, very easy opportunity to get tested for the ARC2 gene mutation. So I decided to do that. It's really simple. You just spit into a test tube that they, somebody sends you in the mail in a box, and you put it back in the box and send it away, and a couple of weeks later you get a diagnosis. Um, so when it came in, as, as I mentioned earlier, as, as an actual ARC2 gene mutation, it was surprising but also assuring to me that, in fact, I did have the disease. And maybe there's more I can do about it by helping others through research. And Anna, what about the implications for family? Um, Lori writes in right now, well, if you have, if you've learned you have the mutation, but you have no signs of, of Parkinson's, uh, what are, you know, what are my, what are my odds of getting the disease? We can ask Dr. Akale or Dr. Singleton to answer that part. But I think there's, there's often this concern about, well, then what about my kids and all of that? How did you think through that, those layers of that question? Because as Dr. Akale was suggesting, it's important to make sure you get good counsel in that process so that you don't jump necessarily to wrong conclusions. Yeah, well, in my family, because this was such a new thing, um, we talked about it at some length, and my siblings, two of my three siblings, living siblings, decided to get tested. One found out she carries the gene, one found out she doesn't. Um, but I don't think any of us have an interest in having the next generation tested at this point. Thank you. And, and Dr. Alkali, we'll stay with us one more beat and then we'll return to the content on the slide here. But um, Lori's additional question is, if you carry the mutation but you don't have signs of the disease, what are your odds of, of actually getting Parkinson's? You, you referenced a kind of 30% chance before, but 
give us a little more nuance um, on that and, and perhaps even why that's the case. Why doesn't the mutation necessarily mean that you'll, you'll get a disease? So the risk um, for Parkinson's doesn't only vary between among the genes that one may carry a variant on. It's also within the same gene. You can have one variant that would increase your risk by twofold and another variant in the same gene that will increase your risk by tenfold. So it is really um, uh, complicated, I think, biologically. Now, um, on top of the biological complication that not all mutations or variants carry the same risk, we have the problem of the design of how do we know how to estimate what's the risk of people with mutations to develop Parkinson's. So the only methodology that has been used so far widely so people could replicate it would be to ask people with Parkinson's about the Parkinson's in their parents, assuming that if one, for example, carries the LARC2 mutation, it means that at least one of their parents carried the LARC2 mutation. And based on the family history, extrapolate what is the um, risk for Parkinson's, the lifetime risk for Parkinson's. But this methodology is limited because uh, some people may have passed away for other reasons before they reach the time for Parkinson's or maybe Parkinson's was misdiagnosed. Uh, and um, and it's, a, it's the best we have, but it's not a great way of estimating. Uh, it's not the best. Like the ideal way would have been to have examined all the people and then say, yes, they developed Parkinson's at this age or no, they didn't. Uh, based on these family history um, uh, methodology, in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, we estimate the risk for Parkinson's in LARC2 carriers at a little bit lower than 30%. And in the non-Ashkenazi Jewish population, it's a little bit higher. It depends on the study. There were studies that showed 35%, but there were studies that showed 80%. So I don't think that the LARC2 gene behaves very differently among different populations. I think it's a lot about study design and a lot about how much we know and how much we still do not know. Uh, with the GBA gene, which is another gene that is relatively common, the gene that is linked to Gaucher, the risk is lower than the risk with LARC2, but it's also debatable in the literature, and the numbers that are given there are anywhere between 10 and 30 percent. So again, a good example, I think, of why getting appropriate genetic counseling is, is helpful to really get your arms around what these numbers mean, because I think it's, it's sometimes easy to make um, uh, wrong assumptions. Um, let's return to the content. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, again, on, on this particular slide, and, and talk a little bit more about how we get from point A to, to point B. And Andy Singleton, as you look at <coughs> this particular slide, um, can you tell us um, more about the mapping process that you're going through from mutations as they lead to <coughs> proteins and, and then what goes um, wrong in that, in that case? <coughs> yeah, so in its most simplistic form um, uh, and the way that most of the, our, our understandings come about <coughs> so far, we're taking um, a single gene that uh, we know contains mutations that cause disease and we are attempting to understand, first of all, what, what the protein that's encoded by that, that gene does. And then secondly, how do mutations change that action? Do they, do they add something new? Do they um, uh, change the way the protein normally functions? Do they cause it to aggregate? What, what role do they have? So this is done using a, a whole host of methodologies. Um, looking at the protein both in its normal form and its mutated form within cells, modeling it in animal systems, um, really all with the notion of trying to figure out what's the problem, where, where, does, this, um, where does this particular mutation exert an effect. So um, I guess a nice example of this and one that um, uh, really relates to the development of therapeutics is LERC2. So, Mutations in LERC2 were found back in 2004, and um, we knew immediately that LERC2 was essentially a switch, a switch within the cell. It's, um, LERC2 stands for uh, leucine-rich repeat kinase 2, and um, a kinase is essentially a molecular, molecular switch. Um, so the idea was that um, potentially 
um, if we could understand whether this switch was more active or less active than normal um, when, the, when the protein contained a mutation, we could um, uh, develop uh, therapeutics against that particular, particular switch. And indeed, that's what's happened. We've shown um, as, a, as a field that um, the most common mutation in LERC2, the GTO19S mutation, um, seems to increase uh, uh, this switch activity of LERC2. It seems to increase the kinase activity of LERC2. So uh, there are a whole host of uh, therapeutics under development at the moment, which aim to kind of dampen down that, um, dampen down that, that, that activity. So I think that's, that's one kind of simplistic way. You take the, the protein that's encoded by the gene that carries mutations and you try and understand what it does. I think um, the, the next kind of generation of understanding is based around trying to not go from one particular gene change to um, a biological understanding, but going from the 40 or 50 or 60 different changes that we know are involved in human disease and trying to map them onto a single, a single network so that we can understand what those, how those biological processes all interact and, and try and find a point to intervene within that within that biological network. So really the, the idea being that the more information that we have, the more we can understand about the underlying biology. So in, in Andy, in a sense then, are these, <clears throat> this genetic, these genetic changes and this mapping process that you're describing, are these, are these um, specific windows into disease? Are this, is this a way, if you think of disease as being this kind of mysterious black box where hard to understand what's going on exactly, is it genetics, is it environment, what is it in play. This gives us a particular way of kind of targeting and understanding that process so we can, we can drill down and, and perhaps find the solution. Yeah, I really like the analogy of a window. So um, when we find a, a rare mutation, it's like um, looking through the tiny corner of a window in a house and trying to understand the complete layout of that house, where all the bedrooms are, where yeah. all the furniture is, all that kind of stuff. I think that um, that has been incredibly beneficial. But the notion of um, expanding our genetic analysis means that we get to look through more windows and we get to better understand where things are and kind of put things together from multiple angles. So I think that's a, a, a neat analogy. And Dr. Alkali, does that also mean that those windows <clears throat> um, are not only a window into a particular house, and maybe pushing this analogy too far, um, but into an entire neighborhood? You know, do you know what I mean? So that it, are, are they this window of, of someone like Anna Cohn Donnelly who car carries the LERC mutation? Is that a window not only into the, her particular path towards disease, but is the supposition here that that also gives us an understanding more generally of people living with Parkinson's disease? Um, sure. I think uh, uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, uh, the longer answer uh, would go back to the point that Andy made earlier, that a lot of those genes uh, come up more than once in genetic studies. So the LARC2 gene, for example, uh, there are mutations in it that clearly increase the risk for Parkinson's to 30, 40, maybe 80 percent. But there's also signals in the LARC2 gene in genetic studies that include people with um, non-familial Parkinson's disease or what we call idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which means that LARC2 probably has a role in the biology of Parkinson's even in people who don't have um, the what we call the pathogenic mutations in the gene. Uh, I think what a lot of us are trying to do in uh, basic labs is to see whether manipulation of the LARC2 biological pathway will affect not only people with LARC2 mutations, but may be helpful for the entire Parkinson's community. And Dr. Alcala, could you just quickly give us a, a sense of where we are in our, our – we've mentioned that there are some ongoing now clinical trials <clears throat> to test drugs against some of these um, uh, mutations, alpha synuclein, LARC2, and, and GBA. Again, that, this is new. None of this would have been going on even just a, a few years ago. The LARC2 and GBA trials have just gotten started. 
Um, <clears throat> how far along are we in that in that process? Are we getting closer to understanding whether or not we can, as you were describing earlier in our webinar, a way to kind of um, uh, reduce the uh, the impact of, of of some of these proteins that have have gone astray. So I think what has been happening is that uh, in many cases, and that includes alpha synuclein as well, uh, alpha synuclein LARC2 and GBA, um, two uh, parallel approaches are taken. One is to try to understand better how a mutation in the gene GBA or LARC2 causes Parkinson's. And the other approach is um, a more practical, pragmatic approach that um, uh, people have been taking in parallel and say, okay, we're not quite sure how LARC2 is causing Parkinson's. Of course, we need to explore that and understand the biological mechanisms. But in the interim, we know that when LARC2 works too much, uh, Parkinson's may develop. So let's slow down the activity of LARC2 in different ways. And with GBA, it's exactly the opposite. We know that mutations that slow down the activity of the enzyme, of the GBA enzyme, increase the risk for Parkinson's. So let's work on this biological pathway to either increase the activity of the enzyme that is not working that well or decrease the activity of enzyme that work, enzymes that work um, uh, to contrast the activity of GBA. And let's see if that would reduce the risk for Parkinson's. And... Um, I think that um, the exciting news is these studies um, have reached the point that they're reaching out to populations of people who carry those mutations to start recruiting them into uh, interventional studies. Um, uh, the uh, LARC2, um, I think, is going to be starting soon, at least based on the information we received through the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And GBA, um, which is a little bit more uh, the GBA mutations, if you inherit them from both mom and dad, one would develop the disease Gaucher. And Gaucher disease has been studied for many, many decades, and there is treatment for the Gaucher disease. It just doesn't penetrate the brain. But because we understand the biology of Gaucher uh, a little bit better because of the experience with Gaucher patients, um, the, ph the pharmaceuticals have been faster in Gaucher than they have been with LARC2, and I think that actively now around the world there is at least three clinical trials recruiting people with GBA mutations into different drugs um, that may either enhance the activity of GBA or reduce the activity of competing enzymes. It's, it's, it's so exciting, I think, to think that all of these um, um, clinical trials are now in motion and that we may soon learn a, a great deal more about, about their potential impact. Um, let's spend a little time talking about getting involved in research and then we'll start taking more of your questions. There are many that have come in and, and we'll return to those in, in a moment. Um, we need people to participate in, in, in these trials who have a certain genetic mutations, but we also need people who don't. You can participate um, regardless of whether you have them. And these uh, mutations, um, these studies rather, uh, help us understand the connections uh, that may lead to precision medicine drugs that could work for people regardless of whether you have that mutation. <coughs> Excuse me again, sorry. Um, and I'll let, touch again on the last point. You mentioned that you're participating in Fox Insight. I think people often wonder, well, what's involved? What do I have to do? Uh, describe for us your involvement with that and how complicated or not complicated that involvement actually is. <coughs> um, it's not that complicated. Sign up for Fox Insight and literally on a monthly basis you'll get a notice that it's time to fill out your forms. Some of the same questions are asked each time and sometimes there are new questions that may relate to a particular <coughs> piece of research or the interest of some clinician working in the field. Um, but basically the questions help you track um, your symptoms, your medications, how you're living with Parkinson's and some related issues. Um, the nice thing is you get to follow yourself over time. So you can go back and see where was I a year ago, where was I three years ago, and see what a dynamic disease it is for each of us. And you can also compare yourself to others with the disease and see how complex and differently Parkinson's affects different people. Um, it, it, it's hard not to fill out because you get a lot of reminders from Michael J. Fox if you haven't filled it out on time. So. 
easy to do. It's true. I, I, it, I sometimes get those. This is your 11th reminder to, uh, to fill out a particular <laughs> thing. So. <clears throat> but it isn't. It, it, it's not. As someone who participates in Fox Insight as well, it, it really isn't that complicated. Dr. Alcalay, as, as a physician and, and researcher, can you also make the case from your point of view about why it's so crucial for people to participate? Sure. So I think I would uh, I'll give you the example of um, answering also the question that was asked before about whether interventions that work on the LARC2 pathway or the GBA pathway, will they be helpful for people without mutations? So for example, in studies that we did, um, that we're doing but others are doing as well, measuring uh, the enzymatic activity or the, uh, of both LARC2 and GBA, we measure that in people with Parkinson's and people without Parkinson's. And um, this helps us uh, to tell maybe a LARC2 intervention or a GBA intervention will not be um, useful only in carriers, but also in the entire PD population. But it is possible that maybe within the Parkinson's population, even people without mutations are not one group. There are those with low LARC2 activity that won't benefit from reducing LARC2 activity, and those with high LARC2 activity that would benefit from slowing down the activity even though they don't have a LARC2 mutation. So uh, for this, we uh, collect, um, funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, we collect uh, urine samples and blood samples and uh, send it um, to labs really worldwide. Um, for this specific project that I'm thinking, we send samples to Greece, Australia, Scotland, and the United States and Canada. And people are trying to measure the activities or the products of these uh, biological pathways to see whether we can identify who with Parkinson's may benefit from such intervention and who may not. Uh, and participating in such study, if you have a center that does that around you, is relatively easy because it's often one-time visit or you commit to one-time visit and then you can decide whether you do more. And often what the researchers would ask for is a blood sample and a urine sample. So even that one-time contribution can go a long way, and if you're willing to do more than one-time contribution of a blood sample or a urine sample, I'm sure that there's uh, plenty of uh, uh, Michael J. Fox-funded projects that would love to recruit you for. And let's touch on one other aspect of participating in research that sometimes gets raised as a concern, which is, <coughs> excuse me again, um, people worry about <coughs> whether or not there's privacy issues, um, worries about, well, will this information get shared? If someone learns I have a mutation, will that affect my employment? Will it affect my health insurance? I want to hear from both Anna and Andy Singleton on this, um, because it's something we've, we've talked about, you and I have before, Anna, as, as members of the Michael J. Fox Foundation's Patient Council. Um, give me your perspective on this first, and then Andy, I know it's a question you're interested in studying and learning more about too in terms of patient attitudes. But Anna, first, what's your response yeah, for those you know, who worry about, about that? Really interesting question. I have every confidence that in studies such as um, the Fox Insight and even the Genetic <coughs> Substudy 23andMe, that information is kept confidential. But the Patient Council had a really wonderful conversation, discussion about this, and I think Almost everyone was in agreement that, let's say someone found out something about myself that I had put in Fox Insight. If it led to a better, quicker cure, I'm all in favor of it. Is this, there's some, so I believe that everything is kept confidential, but if it weren't, it wouldn't concern me. I think it would be helpful to get the information out there. Yeah, that was the consensus within our, our group, at least. Cindy Singleton, I know you're interested in, in studying this question further because it's uh, getting people to participate, getting this information is key to furthering our scientific understandings, but that's not to say that people might have legitimate hesitations. Yeah, sure. And I think that this is, um, this is where informed consent works very well. So, so as you take part in a, a research study, you have to um, go through an informed consent process. And, and really the idea of this process is to explain any risks associated with taking part in the study. Obviously, we all think about um, the risks of revealing things through genetic information, the risks for ourselves and the risks for our family, for our family members. I can say that um, uh, genetic studies are very, very tightly regulated. Um, uh, we have to store the data in a very secure space. 
um, there are uh, limitations on what we can do with the data, uh, depending on, on what we've told the patients we'll do with it. Um, that is also balanced, though, with uh, a desire to want to share the data with other researchers as much as possible. I think that um, gone are the days of um, a slightly eccentric scientist toiling away in a lab by himself making um, singular discoveries. We're in a space now where um, really the great breakthroughs are made through massive international consortia who um, bring together massive amounts of data all towards the idea of um, trying to understand and cure disease. So we we have to um, balance the um, we have to balance the security of the data, which we take very seriously, but also allow ourselves to be able to um, share data with other researchers who are also, of course, keeping the data data secure within their own um, within their own um, research units. And by the way, I should also mention that I, 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 we, we hope to launch within Fox Insight something that I know you've been engaged with, Andy Singleton, which is a, a survey of, of patient attitudes so we get a better sense of what people feel about participating in, in um, genetic research in particular and, and um, ways in which we can make sure that um, those, uh, those concerns are, are uh, addressed. Um, let's uh, turn now to our, our questions and, and that have been coming in over the course of our hour and take our final 15 minutes to address as many of those as we can. Um, here's a question from, from Norman that I'll give to you, Andy uh, Singleton, which is, why the explosion of, uh, of the disease in recent years? Uh, is this from genetics? In other words, we've seen some studies recently that project a doubling of the number of people with Parkinson's perhaps in the next uh, 20 uh, years. Does that have to do with genetics? Why is that, that, we, that there seems to be, that we bump into Parkinson's disease, I guess, more and will be bumping into it more in the future? Well, I think, um, I think that there are a couple of things to bear in, in mind here. First of all, we're doing a much better job diagnosing the disease. So, so I think that um, you see an apparent increase in the number of, of cases because we're just better at, at, at recognizing it. Um, I think we're seeing it more in the public consciousness because of the great work that, that uh, the Fox Foundation has done in, in, publicizing, in publicizing this disease. I don't necessarily think that we're seeing an increase in the percentage of folks who will end up with Parkinson's disease, but of course our population is aging uh, incredibly. Um, with the aging of the baby boomers, um, we're seeing just a, a massive shift, really, in the age distribution of our of our population. So we we can expect to see not necessarily uh, an increase in the percentage of folks who get the disease over a certain age, but an increase in the absolute number of of folks with the disease. Yeah, I think that's worth underlying. We are an aging country, and aging in particular in this country, but of course that, that extends beyond the borders of, of this country, and that Parkinson's is largely a disease associated with aging. So if we have more older people, we're going to have more Parkinson's just as people continue to live longer. Um, uh, here's a question that came in actually before the webinar that I'd like you to address, um, Dr. Alcala. Are there examples from other diseases where a genetic discovery led to new therapies? My, my first thought, I guess, is, is cancer, right? I mean, we used to focus on cancer by location. You have breast cancer, you have lung cancer. Now there's much more, uh, much more of a precision approach, to, and those are often genetically connected. Is that right? Can you describe examples from other diseases where genetic findings have led to specific therapies? Um, <clears throat> there are multiple examples, and I think um, uh, we are, in Parkinson's, uh, we fortunately are in a disadvantage. We cannot look <coughs> under, into, the, in the, into the Parkinson's brain under the microscope while people are alive. So we're always a step back behind the researchers that can do that, and that's mostly the researchers that do um, uh, that do studies of um, infl infectious diseases and of cancer. So in infectious diseases, the most common example of using genetics for, um, for treatment is HIV, where you look at the virus um, 
uh, genome <clears throat> to know which medications it would be sensitive to and which medications it will not be sensitive to. In cancer, um, they're not genotyping the person only the way we do. We don't. We're taking blood from the. We're taking DNA from the blood to look at the what we call the somatic DNA. People in cancer look at the can, at the DNA of the of one's cancer in order to tailor the treatment for the cancer itself. So um, the examples of uh, of treating directly the genetic uh, using using the genetics to lead treatment is uh, absolutely there for cancer and for infectious diseases. The um, I think the most recent neurological example that I think boosted the entire field and makes people very hopeful is uh, treating what we call the genetic form of Lou Gehrig's disease, the um, spinal muscular atrophy, a disease that affects babies and children uh, where um, we know exactly what the genetic mutations are and intervening specifically on the genes or on the genetic pathway has led to two different two different competing treatments that were published um, this year in 2017 in the New England Journal of Medicine back-to-back -back of two different approaches, but they're both targeting the gene specifically. And that is very encouraging for us because it's a neurological condition. So uh, we are hopeful that we can learn from their experience and try to implement some of their method methodologies in Parkinson's as well. And Dr. Kolleg, um, perhaps you could describe one other example that you mentioned in a phone conversation that we all participated in um, before this webinar, which is that there are also examples of where a therapy is developed for a, a genetically specific uh, genetic version of a disease. And then later on, it's, we learn that that gene-specific therapy actually works on a broader population. I think you were talking particularly about a, a, a cholesterol drug. Could you right. just briefly describe that example? Sure, sure. So um, that example even precedes our understanding of the, this happened even before the wealth of knowledge that we have about genetics uh, nowadays. But um, when statins were first uh, developed, uh, simvastatin, uh, Lipitor, and medications like Lipitor, torvastatin, et cetera, um, they were first trialed and they were first targeting people with a known familial his, his, family history of high cholesterol, that their cholesterol was really, really high, and these were people that were developing um, heart attacks and um, cardiovascular complications in their youth or in their 40s the latest with a, with, med with a genetic disorder that is called familial hypercholesterolemia. And that was uh, these, these were the people that uh, the statins were tried on the first, the people that um, benefited it from the beginning. Now, when we look at statins world, the percent of people with genetic with this type of genetic disorders who are using uh, statins is, is really a fraction. So it's an example to how a medication can be or a treatment can be developed to treat a small population, but then once it works and you try it in much larger populations that may benefit from it, uh, the statins are of the most common uh, uh, universally prescribed medications. So similarly, it is very possible, we do not know, that we will develop interventions or LARC-2, GBA, or or, or um, alpha synuclein that initially will be started on will be trialed on people who have a higher risk for or a higher chance of benefiting from the intervention, but then we'll realize that the entire Parkinson's population may benefit from it. And and that would be um, a wonderful um, thing to, to hope for, and hopefully we'll, we'll learn more about that um, soon. Change to bed and uh, raise a, a very practical uh, question that came in, which is, what should the children of a LARC2 gene parent be told? So if you're tested, you learn you have the LARC2 mutation, or one of these others, GBA, number of others. When do you talk about that with your children? Um, Anna Condale, let's hear that from a patient perspective first, and then Dr. Alcala to you. I don't think children need to know what, that their parents carry is the LARC2 gene mutation or any other mutation. <clears throat> I think when people are old enough to absorb the information and to essentially request it, old enough to think through how they're going to deal with it, then you might want to tell them. I don't know what specific age that would be. You know, older is better. An ability to decide that that's information they want is important, and an ability to understand how to use the information is also important. 
So, um, uh, Dr. Alcala, do you concur? Wait, wait till someone's old enough, an adult, to to really process. Right. That so when you when you say children, um, it's a very wide. Um, you know, we're all children. So um, there are a few of my Parkinson's patients in their 70s and 80s who discovered that they're LARC2 carriers because their children got tested through 23andMe or clinical trials, and their kids were in their 50s. So huh. I have had uh, experience with both directions. Uh, what I advise people with Parkinson's who want to do genetic testing is think what you'll do with your kids before you get the genetic results. If you choose not to tell them, that's completely fine. It's your genetic data. You, you, it's yours to share or not share, but just think about it before you get the results back because um, on one hand, we, we're talking about the older kids. I don't think that people in their – like kids that are considered kids, it's really not useful to share that information. But um, – um, uh, when you get the genetic testing, you need to think, okay, if I'm a carrier, will I tell or will I not tell? Don't wait uh, for a positive result to start thinking about that question because some of my patients, when they started thinking about that question, they said, you know what, I'd rather not know because I don't want this elephant in the room. On the other hand, there are families, again, that found out that they're carriers through the children that got tested. In the case of Gaucher, it's even more complicated Gaucher testing is available through prenatal genetic testing. So everyone of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, but in many centers, everyone almost gets prenatal genetic testing that includes the Gaucher gene. So they may find out that they're at risk for Parkinson's in a completely random way that is unrelated to Parkinson's research or to having Parkinson's in the family. Um, well, it's... Uh it's, it's a, it, I think everything you both said underlines the earlier point, which is that it's important if you're going to get testing to make sure you get adequate genetic uh, counseling because there's a lot of layers to this and a lot of important things to think through before you make uh, the decision to get tested and, and or share that information. Um, uh, related to that, here's a, a question from uh, an individual, Andy, maybe you can take this. Um, this individual says that he was uh, tested genetically uh, nine years ago when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's and um, uh, wondering if uh, he should be, and, and didn't learn that there were any, didn't have any mutations, probably, you know, LARC2 or, or GBA uh, are the ones that are most commonly tested. Um, but he's wondering if he should get retested and, you know, in this explosion of genetic information that we were describing earlier that we used to think there was just 10 now there are 80 different regions should you should you not think of a genetic test Andy Singleton as a one-time only thing that you should you should do that again and again as our knowledge increases um, so certainly our knowledge is increasing I, I would say that nine years ago the lurk to and um, GBA variants were available for testing and those were those were probably tested. And those are, those kind of are at the sweet spot of the most common and the most, uh, th and also confer a considerable amount of risk. All of the things that we found since then um, essentially are either extremely rare or confer only small amounts of risk individually. So there's not a lot that you can do usefully with that information from a from a patient perspective, from kind of deciding about um, uh, what you'd like what you'd like to do. From a research perspective, they're incredibly incredibly useful. So um, taking part in in um, research, absolutely. I don't think I would I don't think I would recommend retesting them. And very briefly, because we're reaching the end of our hour, and I want to give Anna a last chance to comment on the importance of research, but, but clarify one other thing, if you could, Andy, which is a question from Bruce, which is to, can, can you say a little bit more about the risk within the Jewish population for Parkinson's compared to the general population? I assume this is a reference to the, the LARC2 uh, mutation, which is more common within the Ashkenazi Jewish population. Can you just review those numbers again one more time, please? Yeah, you can put, put this in the uh, context of um, how common mutations are in, in disease carriers. So um, there are two um, there are two mutations that are particularly common within the Ashkenazi Jewish population. One is in LERC2, uh, and the other is in uh, GBA. Typically, when you um, look at a, um, a North American population, 
um, so not selected based on, on um, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. Uh, we see about 5% of Parkinson's disease cases are caused by um, a variance in those genes. When we look in an Ashkenazi Jewish population, it's, it's much higher. It's um, uh, close to close to 20% for, for both of the mutations. So there, there is um, a more a genetic or a, a more simple genetic component to Parkinson's disease in Ashkenazi Jewish cases than, than in uh, non-Ashkenazi Jewish cases. Okay, thank you. And we have reached the end of our hour. Before we conclude, though, I'm going to ask my, my colleague and friend, Anna Kondanle, to um, make one more um, comment, if you would, Anna, about, about participation in research and why you found that meaningful in your own experience and, and what you might encourage others to do. Okay. Well, in short, it's impossible to think about major discoveries in the ways of stopping reversing, preventing Parkinson's without the participation of people with Parkinson's. We with Parkinson's are critical to advances in research and I would just encourage everybody to see if there's a way they can get engaged and many of these studies really need people without Parkinson's as well. So I would encourage people who are concerned about the disease and don't even carry it to get engaged in research and how, go to Fox Trial Finders. It's one way to find a study going on in your neighborhood that you can maybe be eligible for. Anna, thank you. Um, thanks for your participation in this webinar. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Roy Alcalé and Dr. Andy Singleton uh, for their participation in the webinar and, of course, for the, the work and the research that they're doing on behalf of all of us living with Parkinson's disease. So thanks. Thanks, all three. Um, we'll be sending a link uh, to this uh, webinar uh, so that you can listen again or share it with others and put up with my coughing, um, but hopefully also take in a lot of good information as well. And we'd ask you last to uh, mark your calendar for our next uh, third Thursday webinar, which will be on February 15th, where we'll explore uh, the topic of, of depression and anxiety. I'm Dave Iverson. Thanks for joining us on today's third Thursday webinar.